The assembly will hear an address by His Excellency Felix Antoine Chisekedi Chilombo, President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I request protocol to escort His Excellency and invite him to address the assembly. Monsieur le Président de l'Assemblée. President of the United Nations Generally, General Assembly. It is an immense honor for me to speak to you today for the first time since the Congolese people vested once again their trust in me, electing me for a second term as President of our nation. Having had the opportunity to speak to you before in the past, I'm particularly moved to be able to do it again at this significant moment for our country. I wish to congratulate Mr. Philemon Yang upon his election as president of this 79th session. And at the same time, I wish to pay tribute to your predecessors for their constant commitment at the service of this institution. The theme of this session, leaving no one behind, acting together for the advancement of peace, sustainable development and human dignity for present and future generations, is a theme that particularly resonates with our aspirations in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mr. President, United Nations Secretary General, heads of state and government, heads of delegation, multilateralism and the respect for a global rules-based system have been the essential pillars that have supported peace, security, health and prosperity the world over over the last 80 years. The United Nations embody these fundamental values and remains an essential actor when it comes to the major challenges that humanity must overcome, whether it comes to guaranteeing security or addressing climate change or fighting against poverty. This reality requires strengthened multilateral cooperation. However, the noble ideals of those that drafted the United Nations Charter, that is, for it to serve as an instrument by which all countries govern their conduct, seems to be ebbing away, and the basis of collective security that it established is shaking. We have a responsibility to pull our efforts and to reaffirm our commitment to multilateralism, which is the key for truly transformational solutions in response to the challenges that we see across our worlds. As Dag Hammarskjöld, former United Nations Secretary General, whose sacrifice for peace in the Democratic Republic of Congo which recalls how grave our mission is, so eloquently said, and I quote, the goal of the UN is not to take us to heaven, but rather to prevent us from going to hell. At this critical juncture for multilateralism, multilateralism, multilateralism is of the utmost importance.
It allows us to respond to common threats, to protect our planet, and to strengthen civil society and human rights. Indeed, we cannot ignore the alarming rise in sabre rattling and the indecent resumption of practices of armed aggression and looting of natural resources which affect all continents. The Russia-Ukraine conflict that is ongoing and continues to affect the region is simply yet another manifestation among many others that threaten peace in the world. Yemen, Sudan, Syria and the terrible tragedy unfolding on the Gaza Strip are part of the list of crises multilateralism needs to address. It is essential to act together to progress towards peace, sustainable development and human dignity, thereby ensuring a better future for future generations. Let us not leave anybody by the wayside. This is the clear and relevant message that's inspired the theme selected to guide the work of this 79th session of this August Assembly. Mr. President, the Pact for the Future and its annexes, that is the Global Digital Compact and the Declaration on Future Generations that we adopted during the recent Summit of the Future, highlight the importance of active collaboration to achieve a common vision of a peaceful and prosperous future. These documents represent an essential commitment to put an end to conflicts, to tackle extreme poverty and hunger, and to address challenges such as displacement of populations, illegal immigration, food insecurity, pandemics, and the risks associated with new technology. At the same time, the Global Digital Compact is an essential pillar, part of our quest for a prosperous future and is at the heart of the fourth industrial revolution where digital technologies have become essential. This digital transition is an unprecedented opportunity to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030, in particular for the least developed countries. It seeks to reduce the digital gap and to onboard unconnected populations with digital services with a high social impact. However, in order to address this major challenge inherent to the digital revolution, global reforms are required, involving a reassessment of the international financial architecture and involving adequate financing. For this reason, the Democratic Republic of Congo aspires to attract investment to develop connectivity in Africa and calls for cooperation from multilateral partners and telecommunications operators, with knowledge transfer being key. Indeed, support for the grid development process in our country is a promising solution to uh, link the south and north of Africa and also to link the Indian Ocean to the Atlantic. This includes the establishment of viable partnerships with the Grant Inga hydroelectric project that seeks to respond to the en growing energy demand of our country, uh, which has been increased by the proliferation of connected devices. Furthermore, it's essential to strengthen traceability of strategic minerals, which are essential, and also technological equipment in order to ensure a responsible and sustainable exploitation of our resources. Furthermore, full participation and commitment from youth, both boys and girls, are essential to build a sustainable and inclusive society. This principle is the foundation of the Declaration on Future Generations and underscores our responsibility vis-a-vis -vis future generations and how important it is to make decisions that enable them to flourish. For Africa, 
youth is a major asset for Africa's future prosperity. Investing in education, in particular in STEM subjects, that's science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and creating conducive environments for innovation are crucial. It is essential to deal with the disconnect between a fast-growing young population and the job market by providing the skills that they require to join the job market. Mr President, the situation in the east of the Democratic Republic of the Congo is particularly concerning. The resurgence of the M23 terrorist group supported by Rwanda has caused an unprecedented humanitarian crisis with close to 7 million internally displaced persons. This aggression is a major violation of our national sovereignty. We call upon the international community to firmly condemn these actions and to impose targeted sanctions against Rwanda for its destabilising and damaging role. We demand an immediate and unconditional withdrawal of Rwandan troops from our territory. While recent diplomatic initiatives such as the Luanda talks may be encouraging, they should certainly not overshadow how urgent it is to engage in this essential action. The Democratic Republic of Congo is actively committed to entrenching lasting peace in the east of the country and to promote economic development and the well-being of the so long-suffering communities experiencing this armed conflict. Nevertheless, we are not closing any door to any opportunity that would bring peace while maintaining our sovereignty and our territorial integrity. In this regard, it is, we are resolutely committed to implementing the roadmap adopted as part of the Luanda process, and I fully support that, that promotes high-level dialogue seeking to re-establish trust between the Democratic Republic of Congo and Rwanda while minimising the risk of the current security crisis descending into a regional conflict. Furthermore, my country remains open to any other initiative by our partners that would contribute to achieving this noble goal of peace. The Democratic Republic of Congo reaffirms our firm will to ensure lasting peace. Under my leadership, we are steadfast in our commitment to pursue the implementation of the programme for disarmament, demobilisation and community recovery and stabilisation, the PDDRCS, which is a key part of our national strategy to disarm, demobilise and reintegrate combatants by providing them viable economic opportunities that are also sustainable, while at the same time stabilising the regions affected by conflict. By ensuring a post-Monusco transition, we are also prioritising the repatriation of foreign combatants. The PDDRCS is a crucial tool for peace in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I invite our partners and our friends to support it. Furthermore, thousands of victims of the genocide for economic gain in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in short, the Genocost, continue to suffer from the devastating consequences of a past marked by violence and impunity. Recognising and addressing the effects of this tragedy is crucial to enable the recovery and reconstruction of the affected communities. Beyond immediate humanitarian aid, a long-term approach focused on justice, reconciliation and sustainable development is essential to allow the victims to recover and to return to a decent life. Therefore, the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo decided to make the 2nd of August uh, national Day, the Genocost Day, which is dedicated to the victims of the odious crimes perpetrated by 
rebels supported by multinational corporations and states in the region. This is a national day of coming together, and it allows us to confront our painful past so that we can move forward. It's essential to strengthen the historic conscience of our country and to affirm the determination of our nation to prevent such barbarous acts from repeating. President, terrorism is a serious threat to international peace and security, and it affects all the regions of the world. Having raged in Asia, in Western Europe and in North America, this scourge now seems to be entrenching itself in Africa. As a member of the Global Coalition Against the Islamic State, the DRC urges the United Nations to ramp up its efforts to implement the recommendations of this organisation, in particular when it comes to the Akaba process. Terrorism, which is raging in the east of our country, is closely linked uh, to the looting and illegal exploitation of our natural resources. These criminal activities are nourishing insecurity and financing armed groups, exacerbating conflicts in the Great Lakes region. It is therefore essential for the United Nations to envisage severe sanctions against those responsible for these economic crimes in order to break this vicious circle and to foster peace, sustainable development and human dignity for future generations. President, according to the most recent voluntary national review report for the SDGs, the Democratic Republic of the Congo has made significant progress towards several of the SDG targets thanks to major reforms and interventions. Since 2019, the government has had in place ambitious reforms to ensure free basic education, which has allowed more than 4 million children to attend school. Moreover, Several measures have been taken to strengthen social protection, to introduce universal health coverage and to promote gender equality, as well as fostering and supporting the development of infrastructure and rapid industrialisation via inter alia the creation of special economic zones. Despite this progress, the global report on the Sustainable Development Goals, underscores that at the current tempo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo will not be able to achieve the SDGs by 2030 due to persisting inequality and vulnerabilities, which are exacerbated by armed conflict. When faced with this challenge, a road map has been developed. This covers all the specific actions, interventions and reforms needed the aim being to accelerate progress and tackle the issues set forth in the 2030 Agenda, with some measures underway already to make sure that the DRC will be in line with these SDGs by 2030. For this to work, the Democratic Republic of the Congo needs an annual investment of around $32 billion. It is therefore indispensable to strengthen partnerships for sustainable investment and to promote peace in order to support social, stable socio-economic development. To add to the list of global responses to climate challenges and the promotion of renewable energy, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, having already reaffirmed its commitment to ambitious climate action, which is to underscore the crucial importance of financial and technical support, increased support, so its efforts can also therefore increase to achieve the goals set out in the Paris Agreement. Rich as we are in biodiversity and natural resources, the Democratic Republic of the Congo has taken on the role as a key player in the fight against climate change. Initiatives that are already underway uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions cover four strategic sectors. These are agriculture, forestry, energy and waste management. 
structural reforms are also in place at the moment to reverse deforestation and to improve access to clean energy. This is the proof of the determination of our government to preserve natural resources and to support a green transition. Now, in terms of showcasing our tropical forests, Bali, in November 2022, saw a watershed moment. This was the adoption of the Joint Declara Declaration on Cooperation on Tropical Forests and Climate Action. This declaration was signed by Brazil, Indonesia and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This significant step forward demonstrates the collective political will that there is to use forests as a tool for sustainable development. The Trilateral Cooperation Ally Alliance for Tropical Forests, which was created in Bali, will provide a framework to address biodiversity-related challenges and will also propose solutions for carbon credit markets, all the while ensuring full respect for the rights of indigenous peoples. Moreover, within the framework of environmental and, and global warming related issues, it is also important to underscore the holding of the second summit of the biggest tropical forest basins in the world. These are the Amazon, the Congo and the Borneo Mekong. This was held from the 26th to the 28th of October 2023 in Brazzaville in the Republic of the Congo. This African initiative, which was spearheaded by President Denis Sassou Nguesso, aims to implement, as part of the UN de de Decade for the Restoration of Ecosystems, create the first global coalition dedicated to the restoration of 350 million hectares of land and water ecosystems. These forests are a crucial bulwark against climate change. When faced with these problems that have been clearly identified and we have solutions within reach, it is therefore crucial to act in a concrete fashion. The Amazonian, Congolese and Borneo Mekong basins are home to more than 80% of the tropical forests and play a crucial role in the fight against climate change. And they also provide vital ecosystem services. It is therefore imperative that the improvement of social economic conditions uh, played by local communities, they who play a key role in forest conservation, that their interests be put at the be given top billing in global governance. For its part, the Democratic Republic of the Congo has created judicial instruments and institutional tools that seek to strengthen its position on the global carbon markets, while we still remain open to partnerships in line with the Paris Agreement and our and, its, uh, and our domestic laws. The growing awareness of the challenges linked to climate instability and the depletion of natural resources, which are often the origin of armed conflicts, this underscores the need to act on these issues. It is therefore crucial to recognise the link between climate change, environmental degradation and security in order to foster proactive action to mitigate these risks through sustainable practices. In this connection, we would call on the Security Council to create international mechanisms that include questions of climate security in their discussions. President. Faced with a major energy challenge, the world indeed is facing a major energy challenge. Systems that are based on fossil fuels are responsible for significant greenhouse gas emissions and this ex they exacerbate climate change. Without resolute efforts to promote renewable energy, we would risk, we risk facing even more grave crises. For example, extreme weather, conflicts linked to natural resources, and we are seeing some of this already. The Democratic Republic of the Congo has abundant resources, including essential ores and minerals such as cobalt, lithium, nickel and graphite, to name but a few. 
these could facilitate a sustainable energy transition. We would appeal for international cooperation to develop the necessary technology and infrastructure for this. Our vision is to transform the exploitation of our resources into a tool for inclusive and sustainable development, all the while improving education, health and infrastructure. Social inclusion is at the heart of our strategy as it guarantees the equitable distribution of the benefits of progress. As we invest in the fight against climate change and as we contribute to the SDGs, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is ready to play a key role in the transformation of global energy systems. Together, we can build a future where energy is clean, sustainable and accessible for all. President, I would also like to touch on the crucial question of gender equality. Although equal participation of men and women in political life is something that is internationally recognised, in practice there is still a chasm in t between legal equality and the reality in how power is held. Women's concerns dis deserve to be integrated in the major decisions that affect our society. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we are determined to change mentalities, to overcome the social barriers that are hampering women's, for women from prospering. It is also crucial to involve men in this process so we can transform social trends and we can showcase their role in women's success. On a national level, the Congolese constitution enshrines parity. Also, thus, the government has also created a strategy to fight gender-based violence, a strategy that is focused on prevention, protection and also reparation for victims. This strategy is reflected in our National Fund for Reparation of Victims of Conflict-Related Sexual Violence and Crimes Against Peace and Security, which goes by FONAREV. The current legislation seeks to guarantee this level of protection. Here I wish to underscore significant progress that's been made in terms of women's participation in decision making. With the appointment for the first time in our history of a woman as Prime Minister and Head of Government. We're also seeing increased presence of women in governmental bodies as well as in the judicial system and the parliament, as illustrated by the appointment of uh, women as the first president of the Council of State and the head of the Central Bank of the Congo. President of the United Nations General Assembly, United Nations Secretary General, heads of state and government, heads of delegation, ladies and gentlemen, Leveraging, as we leverage this momentum, it is crucial that the international community under the aegis of the United Nations continue to support the processes underway and reinvent themselves when faced with the challenges of the current world. To retain the trust of the international community, the, the United Nations must prove how it is able to adapt to contemporary changes and overcome these in an effective and responsible way. It is crucial to, re to breathe new life into multilateralism through targeted reforms of the United Nations Charter on key issues such as the Security Council, the veto, Chapter 7 and the use of force. Nevertheless, that won't be enough. Coordination and cooperation between the different institutions and agencies of the United Nations must also be improved. Numerous global issues are often uh, dealt with redundantly in different fora, sometimes taking contradictory angles, well, while other problems remain completely sidelined and each international bureaucracy seeks to justify its own existence. In this connection, while we 
we commend the support of the United States. I would reiterate with strength on behalf of all African countries the request for two permanent seats of the, at the Security Council for African countries. As the main decision-making body within the United Nations, this organ must include African representatives amongst its permanent members with all of the associated prerogatives, particularly the veto. This is to guarantee fair geographic representation. This is a question of justice. Justice for a continent whose role in international affairs is ever-growing. We, Africans, are determined to see this through. Finally, I wish to conclude by recalling that following more than three decades of absence from the Security Council, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is once again submitting its candidacy supported by the African Union and by the Southern African Development Community, SADC, for the post of an elected member for the 2026-2027 period. This will be during the elections which will be held in New York in June 2025. The Democratic Republic of the Congo has already filled this function between 1982 and 1983 and 1990 and 1991. And during these two periods, we worked to promote peace, security and stability in Africa and around the world. Once elected, the Democratic Republic of the Congo plans on playing a proactive role within the Security Council and participate in the revitalization of the UN Charter and contribute, and contributing to, in a constructive way, to the debates and actions related to this. My country, therefore, requests the support of all member states in, as we come up to these elections. At a time when multilateralism is being so sorely tested, the Democratic Republic of the Congo reaffirms its tireless commitment to the international community. We're, and it is ready to shoulder with honour and responsibility the mission to forge a future where peace and cooperation prevail over conflict and division. Nelson Mandela said, and I quote, none of us acting alone can achieve success, end of quote. Thus, we are reaching out to each and every one of you, long-standing partners and new allies alike, to together write this new crucial chapter of our collective history. Together, let's make our world a place where every nation big or small, can prosper in dignity and security. Thank you very much. On behalf of the Assembly, I wish to thank the President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo.